Thank you. Okay, uh, let me get started. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Guillaume, and I'm going to talk to you today about premorphic function types, uh, a feature introduced in Scala 3, which uh, I contributed uh, uh, with the help of others. And uh, basically, the way this is going to work is I'm going to first explain the difference between methods and functions, then talk about what premorphism is and how we want to handle it, then how we implemented this feature in the compiler, then I'm going to give you examples of what this feature might be useful for, and then I will end by talking about possible improvement to this feature we will want to do in the future. All right, so let's get started by defining what a method is. So in Scala, a method is always a member of some scope. It can be a class or an object uh, or a local block and declared using def. Easy, right? Um, and then what's a function? So first I have to define what a value is. So a value is an instance of some type. And the type tells us what we can do with this value, like which methods we can call on it. And a function value is an instance of a function type. Like here f is a function value because it has a type which is a function type from int to string. And int to string itself is not um, magic. It's just a syntactic sugar for function one of int string, where function one is a trait that takes uh, a type parameter that represents the input and one that represents the output and defines an apply method. Um, and when we uh, try to use f as if it was a method by passing it arguments, then the compiler expands that to a call to the apply method. And uh, the next concept, concept I want to define is a lambda, which is just a convenient way to create an instance of a function type. So if I write like x uh, a row x plus one, that's the same as if I had uh, made an anonymous instance of the function one trait with an apply method that takes x and gives you back x plus one, except the lambda is a bit more efficient uh, in the way we generate code, but otherwise it's functionally equivalent. And this uh, new function one thing is equivalent to making a class and then uh, calling the constructor of that class. All right, so, and the last thing that uh, ties things together is talking about how uh, methods and functions are related. So if you have a reference to a method, so here, like in this example, I have list one, two, three, and I call map on it, and then I pass it ink, and ink was defined before as a, a method. Um, then uh, ink itself, because it's a method, cannot be used as a value, but the compiler will let you do that. And what the compiler is going to do is that it's going to convert this method reference into a value by uh, a process that we call eta expansion. And the name just comes from uh, the lambda calculus, but it's just you make a lambda that takes as arguments the argument of a method and that just calls the method. So that's how we do this transformation from methods to values, and it's mostly transparent to users. But because I'm going to talk a lot about functions, I wanted to make the distinction clear. All right, now we are going to uh, uh, talk about premorphism. So first, uh, to recap, we have methods, like here m is a method that takes an x of type int and gives you back uh, a list of int. And f is a function that does the same thing. Uh, and both of these are monomorphic because they don't take any type parameters. But we can also define polymorphic methods, like here m takes any type t and then takes a value of type t and returns a list of t. And uh, the, what we're interested in today is the missing square on the bottom right, which is what if I wanted a function that worked like this method so that could take a type parameter and then give us back uh, a value of type t and uh, a value of type list of t. Um, so what we want is to find some syntax and some semantics so that f here behaves like m right above. Um, and the constraint we have is that f needs to have a polymorphic apply method so that uh, when I try to use f as a value and pass it arguments, 
you compare your expense that to an apply method, as we saw earlier. So we need apply here to have a correct type signature. And that's really the a main thing we need out of a type of F. So we can do that by hand. Like I can make a trait that takes uh, has an apply method with a correct signature. And then I can make a value, which is an instance of this trait. So this works, but uh, it's very uh, verbose, right? Because every time I want to make a different kind of polymorphic function, I would have to make a new trait. And what we want is some solution which is more general than that. So ideally, we would use the same uh, or very similar syntax to the syntax we use for making regular functions, which is lambdas. Um, but uh, in the example here, this code will not compile because uh, in the type of f, t is uh, not defined. And uh, same in the lambda itself, the x current t here, like there's no t in scope, so that will not compile. So we need some syntax that says, oh, by the way, this thing uh, is defined and uh, is an input of f. Uh, so um, the syntax we came up with is this thing here where we take a bracket t uh, arrow. And that means like this is a function, but the function also takes type parameters before the term parameters. Uh, so yeah, f then is a polymorphic function value with a polymorphic function type. Uh, so here's an example of where this is used in Scala 3. So uh, tuples in Scala 3 uh, all extend the tuple trait. And this tuple trait has a map method, which takes uh, um, a function f. And uh, for all t, it's going to take a value of type t and return you a value of type f of t for some uh, f. And the reason why this needs to be polymorphic is because uh, tuples can contain values of different types and you want to preserve that information as you map them. So for example, if I start with a tuple of int string, and then I map it over with a function that uh, takes uh, an, a value of a tuple and wrap it in a list, then the result should be a tuple of list int list string. So to recap, we have uh, this function zoo where we can have functions from term to term, like here f takes a term of type int and gives you back a term of type int, and functions from type to term, where here f takes you takes um, a type t and then gives you back a regular function. And we also, in Scala, have functions from type to type, which I wanted to mention just to avoid confusion. So here, in type f of t equals list of t, f takes a, a type t, and the right-hand side here is also a type. And in Scala 3, we also have this syntax we call type lambdas, which uh, lets you uh, write this without having to define f itself, so you can pass it around. And it's easy to confuse the, the two, right? The polymorphic function one and the type lambda one. But the, the difference is one uh, gives you back a value, and the other gives you back a type. OK, so now I'm going to go deeper into how we have actually implemented uh, polymorphic functions in Scala 3. So OK, uh, here's another table of uh, how functions are defined. So if you recall, a function from int to list of int gets disregarded into uh, function 1, int list int. And I just presented you this new syntax, which is uh, a polymorphic function of, that takes a type t. Uh, a value of type t and returns the list of t. And the question is like, well, uh, that's a nice syntax, but we have to represent this uh, in the type system. So how do we do that? So uh, here's a, our first attempt. So here we have an example of a polymorphic function. Um, and we're going to say, okay, well, this is a bit like function one because it takes one type term parameter one type parameter. So we could make like a poly function one. And this is very similar to the regular function one, except it has to uh, be parameterized because both the input and the output can refer to t. So here, instead of uh, param and result, I have a uh, higher candidate param and a higher candidate result. And I can use that to uh, instantiate this so that this thing is t and this thing is list of t. 
to have a correct signature. Um, but that's not good enough because uh, T itself uh, in the function type could have an upper bound. Um, like I might re restrict T to only work when T is a subtype of uh, int, for example. So I would need to add an extra type parameters to handle this. Uh, and now things are getting complicated. Uh, and if I want to handle multiple type parameters or multiple term parameters, then it gets even more complicated. Uh, so clearly, uh, we need something else. So uh, the something else we're going to do is to take a step back and look at a different feature of Scala and see how we can uh, uh, wrangle it into something that helps us with our original problem. So um, Scala has some support for structural typing, which means typing where the um, the type itself tells you the members defined instead of uh, having to look up into a class what the members of a type are. So um, in Scala 3, we have this special trait called selectable, and you can add a refinement to it. So here I'm saying that S is something which is a subtype of selectable and also has a member foo. Uh, and then I can call this foo. And then there are various rules. Uh, you can read about it if you look up the documentation for structural typing about how uh, the compiler is going to uh, transform this into uh, code that it can run. But the basic idea is just that we have the possibility in the Scala type system to define a type with some extra member. And that's really useful for our original problem because our problem is we need an apply method with a particular shape, but we don't really care uh, uh, you know, on which, what type we are uh, defining this shape. And we don't want it to define a lot of traits like for your function one with one type parameter, one uh, term parameter, for your function one with multiple term parameters, etc. So um, what we want to do instead is uh, to hijack this feature to uh, define a new kind of um, structural types. So to go back to our table before, uh, the way we desugar uh, this uh, polymorphic function type in Scala 3 is we have a special trait called polyfunction. And every time the user writes a type like this, we are going to uh, replace it by a refinement of this polyfunction with an apply method with a correct type signature. And polyfunction itself is just an empty trait. But because uh, whenever we use it, we add this refinement, uh, we can call apply on it and have it do the correct thing at, for the type system. And that also works if we add, for example, an upper bound to T. So uh, this is only half the battle because now we have something that makes the type system happy. But at some point, we want to run our code. So we need something that makes the JVM happy, as well as the other Scala compiler backend. So uh, when compiling to JVM bytecode, but also to the other uh, Scala backends, uh, we need to erase type parameters. So the equivalent of um, the trait function one that we define in uh, Scala source code uh, on, at the bytecode level, it becomes an interface without type parameters. And all the references to uh, type parameters, like here T and R, are replaced by their upper bound, which becomes object on the JVM. Um, and so same at the use side. So here the function that takes a string and gives you back a list of string becomes uh, just function one. And then uh, the way the compiler handles this is it has to insert a bunch of casts to let the JVM know what the, we know from the type system information. Um, so now, uh, talking about uh, polymorphic functions, uh, we're going to face a similar problem where we have all this type information we need to get rid of. At the same time, we could implement this in many different ways, but we care about being efficient. And basically, to be efficient on the JVM, you need to call a method. You don't want to do reflection. You don't want to do anything too complex, like you want a method call on a class or, a or an interface. So uh, we want to erase G to something that has an apply method that uh, we can pass the argument of our original apply method too. And it turns out uh, we have that already because we have function one, 
function one takes one argument and gives you back one argument. So here, because my polymorphic function took one term argument and gave back one uh, result, I can replace it by a function one and I can just insert a bunch of casts as we did before. So uh, in a nutshell, that's how erasure for polymorphic functions works. If they have n term arguments, we erase them to function n. And we do support functions with more than 22 arguments uh, in Scala 3. Uh, and both for regular and polymorphic functions, this is handled by a special class called function XXL that wraps them into an array, just as an assignment. Um, all right. Uh, so now that we've gone through the um, compiler implementation integrity, I will uh, actually tell you what this feature is good for with some uh, detailed examples. Um, so some of them are a bit complex because, well, most of the time you don't actually need polymorphic functions, turns out. Uh, but when you do need them, like you're really happy to have them. So my first example is related to generic programming. So imagine you have an, a trait that defines an order on a type. And um, so it's a, a type class and it defines uh, a method that takes two value of the same type and tell you if the first is less than or equal to the second. So it's easy to define type class instances for primitive types uh, uh, like int or types like string that already have a, a less than or equal implementation. But then if I define my own composed type, like here this case class that contains an int and a string, um, and now I want to define a partial uh, an order for foo, based on the order of uh, each of its components. So I can do that by um, manually summoning the type class instance of each of its um, the type of its fields and calling it on all of these fields. But if you have a lot of uh, term uh, parameters in your class, that gets uh, boring repeatedly. And if you want to have some generic solution that works with all your classes without you having to write code for them, you need something which is uh, higher order. So uh, thankfully, uh, we have shapeless in Scala 3 that gives us some interesting uh, goodies we can use to uh, help with that. So in particular, we can uh, summon an instance of product instances, which uh, takes as input the type class we're interested in and the type we're interested in. And this thing then lets us uh, do a fold on the elements of both X and Y. So we can go through all the elements one by one and we it will take a callback that lets us um, combine together these elements. And this callback has to be polymorphic because these elements can be of different types. So here we have an int and a string. So uh, my I take an accumulator and I take values of uh, each of my um, uh, class uh, elements but one of them is going to be an int, the other is going to be a string, I don't know in advance. So uh, I need to have a callback that works for any type T. And just having values of type T, you cannot really do anything with them. But we also asked for instances of the type class order for all these things. So what this does is exactly equivalent to, um, to what we did before, where uh, we get the type class instance for all of our fields. Um, just in a more generic way. Okay, so the second example is kind of fun. So this is a definition of uh, a list, like very similar to the one that's defined in the Scala standard library. So a list is either empty, nil, or it's uh, composed of a head, and a tail. And here I've restricted uh, the type of list to only contain string. Um, so one of the common operations we define on list is like a fold write. And like the intuition between fold write is that it's going to replace the empty element of your list by uh, a value z. And then it's going to replace every uh, cons by uh, these operations. And 
You can use this for many things. Like one example is that if you want to add an element at the end of your list, then you can replace uh, the empty element by a one element list. And then you can reconstruct the list exactly as it was uh, originally using the same constructor. So now you've just replaced snil at the end of your list by sconst lm snil. So it's one element bigger. And now we're going to make our list type a bit more interesting by adding a type parameter. Uh, so, so what this does is uh, this type parameter is going to keep track of the size of the list. So here I have an empty list, which uh, has size zero, of course. And then when I construct a bigger list, it its tail has size m, and the list itself is going to have size m plus one. And this plus here, uh, works because I'm using Scala compile time ops, uh, which in Scala 3 lets you do arithmetic uh, at the type level on uh, ints. So, um, so this definition of list works, but we have a problem now with our definition of append because um, the, the tail of our list has size one because uh, it's a one element list. But that means that when we append it to our existing list, we want to create a list of size n plus one. But fold right here uh, then does not type check anymore because the zero element of the fold and the output are supposed to have the same type. But here one is going to have type s list one and the other is going to have type s list n plus one. So what can we do? <laughs> So the idea is here is let's make a more complicated fold write function that does the same thing but keeps track in the type of uh, the size of the thing we're folding over. Uh, so instead of taking a type parameter b for the output, I take a, a b that takes a t its own type parameter. The zero element should be b of zero. And then the operation node needs to be polymorphic and it takes uh, b of size m and give us back b of size m plus one. And you can increment that in a way that the result then has the same size as the input. So you end up with b of n. And now uh, where it gets fun is uh, we can use that to implement our appended function by uh, using as or b, we're going to use a type lambda that uh, gives us back a list which is one greater than the input parameter here. So z will be uh, s list of one because it takes zero as input and zero plus one is one, which is exactly the size of new tail. Mm -hmm. And then the output is going to be s list of n plus one, which is what we wanted as our output. I'm taking a pause so you can reflect on this. <laughs> this was an interesting example to construct. Uh, I've like based on a paper I saw. I don't know if anyone has ever used this in practice for anything, but uh, let me know. I mean, you know, people don't like to use like puns rather than rather than the whole. If you're reading this type of type of all operation, I'll have. Literally, normally, turn them in on the cob, like your athlete, proud of them. Uh, will that rep represent it as what? Sorry, I, you're getting a microphone. I guess I shouldn't just shout across the room. But like, <laughs> when I've seen um, lists that track, or you know, representations of sequences that track their, their size and the type, mm -hmm. um, don't you normally just make a sort of append or prepend, like sort of first class operations to avoid this problem altogether? rather than try to generalize it into the fold function. Like this is very, very cool, but mm -hmm. I think that's probably why it doesn't get used very often. So a first class operation as in uh, like you have a append type or something like that. Yeah, I'm sure there's like, <laughs> there's uh, simpler ways to represent this. Uh, but yeah, the, I think the, this could have other usage. Like if you were to convert between two different types, like if I have uh, a vector type which has also a size parameters. And I want to convert my list into a vector type. 
then I probably want to use a fold uh, to construct this vertical type. Uh, or I could use casts everywhere, but that's less fun. Okay, so my last example actually comes from Cat's Effect, so I'm glad that Daniel is in the room, uh, so he can tell me if my explanation makes sense, because I tried to simplify this example as much as possible so it can fit in a slide, uh, which makes it a bit abstract, but uh, hopefully you get the idea. So here again, we have a type class. So here, the type class is called base, and it defines uh, a method base that uh, you can use on any value of type A. So uh, in this example, uh, I have a value A, and I have a base of A uh, in my uh, given scope. So I can do call A.base. Now I'm going to define a more complicated type class called derived that extends base, and it defines two operations. One is called dangerous, and uh, it's also a method you can call uh, on A, and the other is this compute thing that takes a callback. And the documentation of this callback tells us F can call base on its input, but it's not allowed to call dangerous. So here, when I call uh, I pass, I call A dot dangerous on the callback. I can do that because A uh, has type A and I have derived of A in my scope. Then that sh that's wrong. Like, I don't want to allow the user to do that. And the question is, how can we restrict the type of uh, compute to prevent this without preventing the user from calling a.base? So we're going to define a new function, compute safe, uh, just to uh, illustrate the difference. Uh, so the first thing we can say is, well, uh, if we want to avoid people using this as if it was an A, we can replace A by any. And that does solve the problem, but now you have the other problem that you can't really do anything with a value of type any, right? Uh, especially if you want to return an A, it's going to be tricky. Um, so uh, polymorphic functions to the rescue, we're going to ask the user to give us a function that works for any type. And now um, in the implementation of compute safe, we can call F with A as its uh, type input and then get the function from A to A. And we know the user didn't know it was an A, so they couldn't call dangerous on it. But they also could not call base on it. So, <laughs> so this is where we have to add the last piece of the puzzle, which is a contextual function. Uh, so in Scalar 3, we have this syntax where instead of a regular row, we can put a question mark here. And this means that um, this will be uh, considered like uh, an implicit or uh, using parameter. So here what I'm saying is that uh, my function takes a type parameter t, a value of type t, some evidence that t has a type class base of t and returns back a value of type t. And doing all of that means that when uh, I'm in the body of compute or compute safe, I will have access to a type class instance from my input parameter, but I will only have access to uh, the base type class and not the derived one, which means I can only do the safe operation and not the dangerous one. And if you want to know why in the hell anyone will want to use that, please ask Daniel. Uh, or read the documentation of Cat's effect of the async type class and the const, uh, const method, actually, the typo. Um, which uh, describes this very well. All right, so uh, having given you some examples of why any of this might be useful, I want to talk about how we can make it uh, better in the future and especially more ergonomics for the user. And the first idea I want to talk about is polymorphic data expansion, which is uh, something which has been specified as part of the SIP process, and I'm going to use that as a plug to explain what the Scala improvement process is to you. So the idea is when you want to add something to the language, well, okay, so first you have to have an idea. Uh, then you discuss it with people. Then you write a specification document. Then uh, the, the SIP, which is a committee that's uh, chaired by the Scala Center, 
and has various members from the Scala community vote on whether they should accept it as an experimental feature in the language. Then someone hopefully implements it in the compiler and we mark it as experimental uh, so that people cannot rely on it uh, like macros in Scala 2 without us uh, being able to change it. Uh, so that step means we can gather more feedback. And eventually, uh, the SIP members vote on whether to accept the feature as stable, and then we ship it in a compiler as stable, and everyone is happy, hopefully. And at every step in this process, there's a lot of back and forth between the members of the community, the SIP committee members, to ensure that uh, everyone uh, is uh, aligned and we get the best possible outcome. But in a nutshell, this is how it works. For the details of the process, you can go on the, um, yeah, the Scala SIP website that gives you the exact process we're following. But anyway, so the SIP I want to talk about today, uh, SIP 49, has uh, been going through this process and it's at step four, it's been accepted as experimental, but it wasn't implemented in the compiler yet. Um, so the idea here is when you have a method reference, if you recall with regular method reference, we adapted them using ETA expansion. So the idea was to do the same with polymorphic methods by doing polymorphic ETA expansion. So here we have this uh, singleton method that takes a value of type T to list of T. And we want to be able to call map on singleton without having to define the lambda by hand because that's a lot of things to type. Um, and the, so the process of polymorphic data expansion is you look at the type of singleton, you see that it's polymorphic, you look at the type of map, you see that it's polymorphic, uh, and then you replace singleton by a polymorphic function and the type arguments come from the signature of singleton as well as the term argument, and then you apply uh, both the type and term arguments. So there's basically two data expansions happening here, one for the term arguments and one for the type ones. Um, so I actually implemented this for this talk, uh, and then I realized, well, actually that's not good enough, because uh, <laughs> something I really want to be able to do is uh, pass a lambda here, like x to list of x, and not have to worry about the type parameter. And that wouldn't work with this, uh, just with polymorphic data expansion, like I could pass list.apply, but I could, couldn't pass uh, x to list of x or list of underscore, which is kind of uh, confusing. Similarly, if I have a function from uh, t to string, I want to be able to pass uh, underscore dot to string and not have to worry about having to pass the type parameter. So we need a different feature to be able to do that. And so the idea I came up with recently, and I want to propose this to the SIP committee, but I haven't yet, and also gather feedback, which is why I'm talking about it today, so people can tell me if this makes sense, is to do type parameter close inference. So when I have as my type of my, my expected type here is a polymorphic function. And I'm trying to pass a regular lambda here. So there's a mismatch. And right now the compiler will like complain with an error. And the idea is to instead, if the term parameters are, uh, the, have a, we have the same number of term parameters in the lambda and in the expected type, then we can adapt this thing into a polymorphic function by just adding the type parameter close here. And then we can use type inference to say, okay, here we have an X and the expected type of the parameter is T, so this should be X dot T. Easy, right? Um, and yeah, if we do that, then we can uh, compute our uh, uh, function from X to X dot to string and make it polymorphic and have it work the way you'd expect it to work. Um, another interesting thing is if we do that, then we don't need polymorphic eta expansion because we can rely on regular eta expansion and combine it with uh, what we just saw. So I'm going to run you for an example. So we're back with our singleton polymorphic method and we have our, uh, we try to use it where we expect a polymorphic function. So instead of doing polymorphic eta expansion where we uh, 
did like two eta expansion for the term and the type parameters. We are only going to do the regular eta expansion that uh, takes care of transforming this into a monomorphic lambda. Now we are back into the situation we had in the previous slide where we have a regular lambda and we expect something that is polymorphic. So we add a type parameter. And now we have to do type inference to find out the type of x. So we find out it's x.t. And here we are almost where we were in the original polymorphic eta expansion example, but notice that we don't have a type parameter for singleton here because we never added it via eta expansion. But type inference can figure out type parameters at applications for us. So because this is singleton of x and I expect a list of t, then this thing has to be t. And so what's interesting about doing things this way is it means that the number of type parameters in singleton and the number of type parameters here don't necessarily have to match because it's up to type inference to fill this instead of up to eta expansion. Uh, but in most cases, it's going to do what you want, I think. But please tell me if this is more confusing <laughs> than the other way around or if the uh, usability improvements outweigh the uh, confusion. <laughs> um, all right, so last idea, which is actually a fairly simple thing. You could call it a, a missing feature in the implementation. It's to improve subtyping. So uh, just a brief recap on how subtyping works with regular function types. If I have a function from any to int and I pass it to something that expects a function from any to something else, what can I put in this box here? Um, so because uh, this thing is allowed to uh, be less precise, like if I give it an int as a result type, it's OK if this thing wants something that's less precise than an int, that is a super type of int. So uh, I can, for example, pass it to someone that only wants any as a result type. Uh, in other words, the result type is covariant. But now, uh, the other way around, um, if I have, again, my function from any to int, and I pass it to someone that wants something else as input, what can I put in this box? So here, because um, uh, the, the function is ready to accept anything as input, then if someone is only going to give me a subtype of any, like int, this is going to work because uh, this function can take anything as input, so it can take int as input. Uh, so here the variance is flipped, parameters are contravariant. Uh, for polymorphic function types, it turns out that right now uh, they're completely invariant, and it's just because it's an artifact of how they've been implemented. You remember the refinement uh, thing with the apply method. Uh, we don't have subtyping for that, but for polymorphic function, it makes a lot of sense for them to have uh, subtyping because they are functions and you want to be able to uh, make them more or less precise. So working for an example, if I have a polymorphic function, which, which result type is option of t, uh, it's OK, or it should be OK for me to uh, pass it to something that expects a function that returns anything. So the result should be covariant. And uh, for the term parameters, it's going to work exactly as for term parameters of regular functions where uh, they should be contravariant. So if I uh, expect any sequence of t, I'm OK if someone gives me back a list of t. And then for the type, type parameters, uh, if I'm ready to take any t which is a subtype of any, then I'm also happy to take a t which is a more of a more precise type, like a t is, has to be a subtype of int. Um, and then I haven't shown what happens if you have a lower bound. Uh, but you can work it out, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the variance gets flipped once again, but people don't care so much about your bounds. So uh, this is something I want to add to the language because I think it would be a very useful addition. Probably people expect it to work that way and are confused that it doesn't work that way right now. Uh, so there's one interesting thing to note here. It's when we're comparing these types, um, like sequence of t, list of t, 
uh, here the name are the same, but you notice that instead of T here, I could have S, for example, this could be S subtype of any sequence of S option of S, and I could have T on the right hand side. So uh, that should also work, uh, which means that when you're comparing uh, parts of the type, like the result type or the argument types, you need to do a substitution uh, to make sure that you're uh, referring to the same um, type parameters. Like, uh, because this one is more precise, I should use the T from this one uh, when doing a subtype check between the parameters of the two things. Uh, and if that doesn't make sense, don't worry about it. Uh, uh, all right, so uh, that's all I had to talk to you about today. Uh, the slides of this talk are online. If you're interested in learning more about how the compiler works, we have uh, uh, pair programming sessions we recorded on YouTube, and we organize new ones where people can uh, come and um, get uh, help working on compiler issues. And uh, this is part of the Compiler Academy that Anatoly is going to talk about in his uh, talk, which I think is in the next slot. And uh, we can also chat online on the Discord uh, Sky Contributors channel. Thank you. <laughs>